Okay, let's start. Welcome, everybody. So this is a big data engineering lecture. My name is Jens Dittrich. I will be running the show. So I have the, I'm the head of the big data analytics group. And um, today we will mainly focus on administrative issues. So I will walk you um, through the um, yeah, regulations we have for this lecture, a little bit of the content, what you can expect from the lecture, what you expect uh, that you should learn throughout the semester, why that is important, uh, why you should attend the course, uh, and so forth. The um, PDF I'm using is already available in our CMS, and that will always be like that. So before every lecture, I will upload this stuff. I will also record each and every lecture and upload it after the lecture to our CMS via YouTube. Huh? There will be a YouTube link. Right. So with that, let's start. Um, so that's basically the, uh, the overview of today's lecture. And um, yeah, that's the slide I showed on Tuesday already that summarizes, maybe you read it a little bit. And what all these abbreviations mean, you will learn in this lecture. So don't worry if you don't understand that. But the interesting thing about database systems, and I also said it like that on Tuesday, it's back in the 80s, it was basically like ChatGPT today. And ChatGPT is the big revolution we are currently seeing, and no one uh, knows where that is going. And a similar uh, thing happened not with AI, but with databases in the 80s. And the major takeaway uh, um, back then was all of a sudden, you could automate things people believed had to be done by hand. You had to hand write, you had to, to write uh, code for concurrency control yourself that was error prone and uh, nasty and hard to debug and hard to test and always uh, there for nasty surprises. All of that was gone all of a sudden. Huh? because we have fully automatic concurrency control in database systems where we delegate all of the na nasty things to the system. And, and that's awesome, in particular for developers yeah, who are not that much into concurrency control theory. Yeah. And that holds for many other things, in particular transactions we will see in this lecture, and they play a major role in many, many applications. Uh, crash recovery uh, is an important concept in database systems that plays a role when a database system crashes, for instance, due to a power failure. Yeah, you have a power failure, and maybe some of the data was only available in main memory, some was on disk, you changed something in main memory, then there's a power failure, the data is gone. Your changes are lost, so what do you do? So all kinds of weird situations may happen, but all of these problems were so, are solved with database systems using crash recovery. So this is more topic we will only uh, scratch briefly. Uh, more details on that will be available in the core lecture database systems. We have fully automatic phys physical um, data independence. That's a, a super important feature. So um, the takeaway is that you don't have to be aware um, which data structures are used by the system, how data is stored, how data is accessed in detail, which algorithms are used, we really don't care to a certain degree. We have an abstraction level on top where we completely um, ignore all of these, what we call physical details or physical organizations of the data. And that's a super cool feature of database systems because um, it gives you a lot of opportunities for optimizing a database system, and it makes your database system easily transferable from, what, from one um, installation to another, from one system to another, from one computer architecture to another, without changing anything in your actual database system. Yeah, and one of the strongest features in um, database systems you will see is fully automatic query optimization. Um, so what that means is that when we access data in one way or the other, there's a very clever compiler, a domain-specific compiler, um, how we call it, that makes sure that the data retrieval happens as quickly as possible, as efficient as possible. So you all, you all know compilers from programming too, I hope, yeah? So you're compiling whatever, C or C++ to some executable code. Something very similar happens in database systems. However, our language is not called C or C++. Our language, we're using the input language is called SQL, SQL for short. So here I have that abbreviation again, right? So we will be tackling that uh, in the third week or something like that. And that is translated to executable code through a long pipeline we will briefly look into in this lecture 
it's, it's very cool stuff that's happening there also algor algorithmically. Yeah, so you sh my, my main takeaway is when you understand what databases can do for you, you, will have, you can stop worrying in many places. Yeah? If you feel like, oh, that's a complex problem, in this course, I will teach you how to map these complex problems to databases such these complex problems are like super easy to do yeah? and don't require that much coding anymore. Okay, and that brings me to this, uh, what I call the laziness principle of computer science. So not the laziness principle in the teaching or not doing homeworks or stuff like that, but in computer science. And that means whenever possible, you should try to map problems or sub-problems to an existing problem. Then use existing solutions to solve that sub-problem rather than reinventing everything from scratch. Yeah, I, I, I witness that not every day, but every week with people that uh, in particular developers and computer scientists tend to, hey, I can code that, I make the efficient, I do it like this and that without thinking first, hey, maybe someone thought about that first. Maybe there's already a community working on that. Maybe there's a, a, a so solution I could use directly out of the box. Yeah? So uh, developers have often a tendency to um, yeah, reinvent the wheel. Yeah? So in the context of this lecture, this means you should use a database system rather than coding the data management stuff yourself. This doesn't mean that in 100% of the cases where you're uh, handling with um, tackling uh, data, you should use a database system. There are cases where it's a good idea not to use a database system. And I will also talk about that briefly here and there. But there are many, many cases where you really should be a database system and you would be completely stupid to not use it. Yeah? Um, and you see many examples on that for that for um, yeah, people not using database systems and then running into problems. I will get to that in a moment. Yeah, and then this in particular leads to the missed opportunity for laziness principle. So if you don't know that a sub-problem could be mapped to an existing problem, you miss a chance to apply the laziness principle. So for instance, you work on something, you run into a specific problem. Let's say you have an algorithmic problem on a graph yeah, and then you, oh, how could I solve that? Oh, that's a graph, yeah, but hmm, maybe I think about that myself, maybe some topological sort, sort, or whatever you learned about graphs in your data structures and algorithms lecture. But another approach to do that would be, hey, it's a graph. I need an algorithm for a graph problem. Why not ask an expert in graph theory or algorithms on graph? For instance, we did that in a pro project here recently where we approached Karl Bringmann. Yeah? He's an expert in graphs. We asked him, and great. Yeah? He had great hints and ideas on, on how to do these things. Yeah? And that is something you really should learn as a computer scientist or data scientist or AI expert or whatever. Understand when there's a problem that's probably better solved by a domain expert. Yeah? Because you will end up with solutions that are so much better. You save tons of work. It's just, it's, you will see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, here I summarized it again on that slide. So that's a high price of missed laziness. Basically because it le uh, leads to uh, reinventing the wheel. Huh? Now when you reinvent the wheel, if you reinvent stuff that was already solved by other people, yeah, you, you will have development costs for those features. Yeah? Yeah, you need manpower mid, which may translate to money in a company or at a university eventually. You have costs for uh, testing, writing unit tests, integration tests, and so forth. So that, that's a lot of work for, for getting these things right. Deployment costs. Deployment meaning, okay, it's one thing to develop a system and to test it. It's a whole other dimension to deploy the system to make it, uh, uh, to, to ha and have it used by, by real users. Eh? It's a whole different dimension. And then in particular, that's something we also saw in a research project recently. Uh, development costs to add new features. So if you do it uh, yourself and reinvent it from, reinvent the wheel, yeah, when you want to have a new feature, you have to implement it yourself. But if you use a library and people, uh, other people maintain the library and add features to that, maybe you get new features for free. It's like, like with any software project, software tool, yeah? if you have whatever, some image editing software, uh, you could decide to, to write your own image editing software, that's fine. Or you could decide to buy something, maybe it's very costly, but every year you got, get, get tons of features yeah, like for free. Yeah. 
And, and that's the basic trade-off you have to look at. Huh? And the other is, of course, maintainability issues um, of the code you're writing. So in summary, um, typically these homebrew solutions fall far behind existing ones in overall quality features, oops, performance, uh, maintainability, documentation, support, and so forth. And in the context of this lecture, that means that there's 50 years of database research, at least. Yeah? So the main principles, can you hear me? the main um, things, the concepts we will be learning started in the 70s already. And it's a little bit like in physics. Yeah? There's laws that are just there. You don't have to invent a new law. The, 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 the laws just work. Uh, like, I don't know, uh, Newton's gravitational law. It's just fine as long as you're not close to the speed of light. It's fine, right? Yeah. Then there's Einstein fixing it a little bit for these special cases. But Newton's law is still OK. And you can uh, do your calculations with that. That's fine. The same holds here. Yeah? So our Newton's law um, is basically um, entity relationship modeling, relational algebra, and these things. You will learn about that. Um, but um, my message here is really there's tons of researchers that thought about these problems. They solved these problems and condensed that into database systems, libraries, and best practices. And I will introduce you to what these systems are, what they can do for you, and how you should tackle certain uh, situations. Yeah, and then there's this divide between industry and university, which is super wide. It's super stark. So it's, um, I had my, <laughs> so basically I, I did um, a PhD in database systems a long time ago. And then I went to a company. I believed that did database systems. It was a huge <laughs> um, shock for me because um, they were far behind uh, in, in terms of technology and uh, using different weird terms. Yeah? These terms we call buzzwords. So when you, when you just, if you read an article on Heise.de or Computer World or whatever magazine or computer science, uh, you will run into uh, weird terms. Big data is one of those big terms, by the way. And a data lake may be another one. So who heard data lake? Read about that? One only? Okay, yeah, that's probably two. Yeah. yeah, so there are many of those terms. And some of these terms make sense. Yeah? And some don't. Yeah? So there are terms like, for instance, information system. Yeah? I will explain that later on. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's also, in that data analytics field, there, there are terms like artificial intelligence, which is very vaguely defined, the same holds for machine learning, and so forth and so forth. Question? Okay. Um, yeah, and there are other terms like databases, which is really clearly defined, and so forth and so forth. And it's sometimes very difficult to, un to, to understand what these terms actually mean. I will, I will say more about that later on in the lecture, why there, why there really is a problem with that. Right. Um, yeah, another term you might have, who heard about data science? The term data science. Oh, that's a bit more. Uh, it's not as widely used as AI, of course, and machine learning. Data science is uh, just another, uh, yet another term that's very hard to define what it means. Uh, but you can think about it um, as a cake. Yeah? So if people do data science, they typically use techniques from very different domains. They use techniques like from artificial intelligence, the machine learning, and the, the, the cake pieces look very different from the cake pieces of that domain, which is data mining, which is another subfield of computer science. And there's data management. That's what we are talking about. And there is an application domain, so which means in data science, typically you have data from a real user. For instance, a user from physics, a user from chemistry, from material sciences, you name it. That some data you want to analyze. Yeah? So there's always this application domain, uh, techniques and knowledge uh, you, sh you should know about. Yeah? And to bake such a cake, uh, there, there are other more uh, foundational ingredients you need. You need some statistics, some linear algebra, you need programming, visualization. Software engineering plays a major role in at least um, yeah, in industry environments. And you need additional uh, skills like creativity, out-of-the-box th thinking, grit, and team spirit. So grit is um, a property in, in German. It means bis, yeah? meaning so if there's a problem and you can't solve it on the first shot, well, then try it again, try it again, try it again, 
try it again and try it again and again and again and again and again. And it's very important in research, but in particular also in fields like data science and AI, um, because problems sometimes are, it's not clear how, how to solve new problems. Yeah, let's look at the term big data. So there's a quote missing here, actually, it should be like that. So the term big data, and uh, who heard about big data? I mean, it's big data engineering, probably you heard about <laughs> big data in a way, right? Yeah, some of you. Yeah, big data is another term that sounds like, um, oh, large data, right? But that's wrong. You will learn in this lecture that that's one possible translation of the term, but not the most, uh, but not the one that makes the, the, the highest amount of sense, so to say. Huh? Uh, a term I like a lot is um, database geologist. Yeah? So the scientists that, um, yeah, that do research in the database field, in the database subfield of computer science, database geologist, that's what, what I could call myself. That, that the term was phrased by Andy Pablo from CMU. And um, yeah, we had that effect in the past, say, 15 years that people all of a sudden started talking about big data. Now, oh, big data, we have big data sets, we have to handle them, blah, 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 blah. And that was pretty weird because there has been a community doing exactly that in databases, and it's called very large databases, not big, but very large. And they started in 1975, yeah? so almost um, 50 years ago. So it's pretty weird that all of a sudden, hey, now we do big data. Oh, we did that 40 years ago, come on. What do you want? Huh? So uh, the important things to know about that is that technically managing and requesting large amounts of data has long been solved if you know what you're doing. There are always people that claim, oh, I have my data set. I can't query that. I can't handle that. You can. Yeah, it's, it's technically all solved if you know the tools from this lecture and maybe some other lectures uh, in databases. Huh? If people have performance problems with large amounts of data, it's seldom due to hardware or software. In 99.99% of the cases, it's an education problem. Yeah, of the data developer or computer scientist, yeah, the, you see that when, when you use certain web pages, for instance, yeah, if you, I don't know, whatever, this web page we're using here, our CMS, under the hood of that web page, there's somewhere a database system that handles all of the data. And if there's a performance problem in the web page, it may have two reasons. Either it's a web application, there may be more, but in general it could be, yeah, you could uh, say it's two, let's claim it's two reasons. So the web application somehow, network, whatever, or the database system. And you see that in certain um, systems or certain web applications, you click somewhere and then it takes a long time before the system returns. Yeah, you're studying here on campus, you have seen these kind of systems, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want to say any names, <laughs> but we all know what we're talking about. <laughs> the, yeah, and th 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 that's, there's no technical principle problem whatsoever if you have an issue like that. If you know what you're doing, you can solve that. Whatever web page, it's always like that if you know what you're doing. Yeah? So it's, it's always yeah, people don't understand what they're doing, using it in the wrong way. And that's kind of sad because, yeah, then you have these systems and you have yeah, thousands of students suffering from slow performance of system X, Y, Z. And that's not good yeah, because it uh, kills your lifetime and, yeah, and you don't want to do that. Yeah? You want the, the, the experience for the users to be smooth. And, um, what's also interesting is this combination of database technology with other sub, other subfields of data science. So we did a lot of stuff where we uh, took data um, and analyzed it. Um, for instance, at some point we analyzed data from earthquakes or uh, we did weather forecasts with um, data science method. So that was pretty interesting. Or what's a very hot topic currently in my area is um, using machine learning to replace algorithms. That's pretty cool. So for instance, if, so who attended already data structures and algorithms? Some, yeah, okay, so you learned about search trees, binary search trees, balanced, whatnot, maybe B trees, probably not B trees? No, right? No, okay. Huh? So you learned about in, uh, um, data structures and there's work claiming that you can replace data structures by machine learning. So you don't have to implement or use data structures traditional data structures anymore, but use some machine learning thing, which does the same thing much faster. 
Yeah? And that holds for many areas in, in my uh, field where you can replace certain algorithms with deep learning, machine learning, you name it. And that's a pretty exciting area, actually. Yeah, so important topics for data science are those, just uh, don't have to read all of that, just saying if you do data science, you better know about um, databases and big data engineering. And that is why for the DSAI bachelor, this lecture is compulsory. There's no elective option. This is compulsory because it's so super important for data scientists. Yeah. What, um, there's, a common, there's a common misunderstanding. You also see um, when people yeah, try to analyze data. So they, here's, um, there's this notion that um, people believe that how the data is organized doesn't matter. Only the complexity and efficiency of the algorithms is important. Yes, so you learn about that in the uh, uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical computer science classes, yeah, you analyze these complexity classes, and that's all super important and, and uh, a very important tool. We're also using uh, these tools. However, the problem with database technology is our algorithms typi typically run in complexity classes that are linear or maybe n log n or log n or something like that. So it's not so much of a problem. In our world, the constants, the real costs of the algorithms are much more important. And when, when, so we, 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 we don't stop by just using um, uh, complexity analysis. We have to model in detail and predict, predict the detail of, um, predict in detail the runtimes of our algorithms. And when you do that, you quickly find out, well, you better understand how data is stored and how data is retrieved from the storage system. Um, that makes a huge difference. So and here's an example we had in a consulting situation from a startup I was involved in. So we had an initial situa situation. Yeah, there was some guy using a, you ignore the names, yeah? some big data stuff, some big data systems, however they are named. And uh, yeah, we analyzed that and found out that just by changing how data is stored, you could be ten, ten, factor 10,000 faster for this simple application. Yeah? So it's, well, what I'm talking about is not just a few percent. I'm just not saying you change your storage in a 10 percent faster. There are really extreme cases where it's, it's four orders of magnitude uh, that you can be faster. And th that also meant in that case you can throw away your expensive computing cluster. You don't need it. You can do all of this on a smartphone. That's fine. Yeah. And that, that's a huge difference in, uh, if you know what you're doing and get the uh, data organization right. Yeah, there are two, there's one term that um, is important in, in that regard that's called kiwi, kill it with iron. And that's a good idea, yeah, don't get me wrong. So what that means is if you have a software and you have a performance problem, the first thing you think about is can I solve it uh, by buying new hardware? That's typically much easier and much cheaper than touching the software. If you change the software, well, you have to test it, maybe you introduce bugs, maybe you get downtimes, maybe your users complain, maybe you are out of business eventually. Yeah, so it may be a, a, something you could do yeah, to a certain degree. <clears throat> However, it's, it's, if you have the, uh, uh, if, if, if possible, you should do this, yeah, kill it with intelligence. Yeah, yeah, let's think about it. Can I uh, reorganize the software? Can I use uh, different uh, storage organization techniques, some database stuff that will help me there? Okay, yeah, and finally, um, um, you will see in practice, um, in particular people that talk about large data sets or big data as, as it's called sometimes. Um, actually, it's like that, that the performance of the database technology plays no role in many, many applications, including uh, web applications that come to your mind. And that is the case when the data is small, and the hardware is so fast that it makes no difference. You can observe that um, in the data science domain in particular. So, I don't know, 15 years ago, no, people would never have used Python, uh, um, a scripting language that's super slow and compared to C++ or Java to do data processing. It was really a no-go area. But when you think about that, yeah, maybe Python is 20 times faster, uh, slower on average uh, than C++ or 30 times, or depending on what you do. So an order of magnitude at least, slower. Um, it doesn't matter. Because, I mean, 
if your data only has a couple of thousand rows, it's still like that, whatever you do, right? because complexities are linear or log n or whatever, it doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt. From a human perspective, what you observe, you don't observe anything different, it's super fast, yeah? You don't need C++, yeah? You can execute it like that in Python on small data sets. And that is why in the data science domain now, uh, Python has become super popular and it's a weapon of choice, yes? Um, no question about that. However, there are cases where the performance of the database technology plays a major role. Yeah? And that is this other case, it's a 5% case, or maybe it's even smaller, yeah? when the data gets larger, or maybe there are many, many users in the system, and the hardware, hardware wasn't uh, chosen appropriately, and so forth, yeah? then this, these more advanced techniques um, come into play. So in this lecture, we will focus on this part. That's, you need that anyway, whatever case you're in, because there are so many design decisions and techniques that play a role, even for solving this case. And then it's not so much about um, performance, it's about other things, robustness, being able to recover in a crash or handling the concurrency uh, problems in database system. So what are the learning objectives? You should understand the fundamental techniques in big data engineering conceptually, you know, the 95% case, and we do that through slides and exercises with homeworks. Yeah? Every week you will have a homework. You can hand it in in groups of two to three people, only hand it in electronically through CMS, no email or printout whatsoever. You should learn to apply those techniques. And uh, we do that by looking at Python, SQL, and Jupyter. So we will work with Jupyter notebooks. Also part of the exercises um, may contain Jupyter notebooks that you should hand in. That will help you re um, avoid reinventing the wheel. So you should learn to apply the laziness principle. Of course, there are many, many other things uh, you should learn about uh, throughout your uh, studies about the laziness principle and yeah, other um, sub-areas of computer science um, that make you aware of certain uh, tools and libraries. This is about databases, of course, and data management only. Um, yeah, I, will, I also want to raise awareness for possible problems. Um, so that's not a core topic of databases, but you will see, oops, oh my gosh, by handling data, all of a sudden you can run into really, really severe privacy concerns. And we will see that is the real meaning of big data. That is the real problem of what big data, um, yeah, entails or implies for society. Yeah? I will, give you very concrete examples uh, what the problem is and how to fix those things and, uh, and, and, and how that leads to ethical issues. Yeah, um, and yeah, finally, I will also uh, give you um, ideas about possible solutions on, um, in terms of effort, doing things, performance, robustness, extensibility, and maintainability. Yeah? So that's the learning objectives of this lecture. So what we do is, um, my idea for the lecture is not to just uh, fill you up with uh, yeah, conceptual stuff, but I will always motivate it by certain applications I have in mind. So the main structure you will be seeing is a two-week structure. We will uh, divert from that here and there, but we start with that structure at least. So I will present a concrete application, uh, X, Y, and then we will talk, um, yeah, show that application, what it does and what it doesn't do, and uh, uh, where there's data in that application. Then we talk about, okay, what are the data management and analysis issues behind that application? And based on that, um, I will teach you the basics that uh, allow you to solve the problems or, or do the things that application is doing, along the lines of slides, but also along the lines of Jupyter, uh, Python, and SQL hands-on uh, notebooks. And then finally, we will, once we learn those basics in the lecture, we will go back to that application. Yeah, that's what the step four is doing and transfer the, the concepts, the theoretical concepts we learned on the application. And uh, okay, now we know about these concepts from data management. What does that mean for that application? Where do we see that? Uh, you will, so you will have two views on the application. First, okay, yeah, it's an application that does things. Uh, and then finally here you will get the other view where you know, ah, yeah, yeah, right, it uses this technique, right? And there's that technique and so forth. So. Um, and for the assignment uh, sheets, um, the structure uh, is mostly like that. So you will have two tasks with reference to basics. So the slides, one task, uh, hands-on, Jupyter notebooks, 
and one task with reference to transfer of the basics to the application. That's basically the structure of the assignment sheet. Okay, here's the schedule. So if you attended the lecture last year, it's 90% the same, a few exceptions. Yeah? So we, um, I always have this attitude, um, not say it's kind of, you always, yeah, yeah, this year the lecture is great. I mean, we won a Busy Beaver Award two years ago, and last year we got the honorable mention for the lectures. We, yeah, now it's fine. Let's keep it like that. We don't touch this stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. One day later, hey, but what if we did this, right? And we could also, yeah, right. Yeah. So there will be changes, yeah? So I will be going over the slides every week. And uh, one thing we will be doing is, and that's new, is this part here. So last year we had two weeks of what we call data journalism. Uh, now we have something new that we will do here, and that is called object relational mappings. That is a super cool technique um, that is uh, useful when you develop web applications. Yeah? Assume you uh, developed a student management system, a system that manages the grades and transcripts of records, but you want, you want to do it right yeah? and, and fast. Yeah, with a great user experience, yeah? Then you would use this stuff. And I want to give you a little idea on that because I, I, I program, the, for the past uh, nine months, I, myself, I'm currently de uh, developing a web application for students in my management, different thing. Uh, but, so I, I did a deep dive into this technology based on Django. Django, uh, not the Tarantino movie, but, but it's a, a web application framework, which is really cool. And it's based on Python. Hey. Cool. Yeah, you can do your web application on Python and, of course, a relational database technique uh, the system underneath. So we will do at least one week of this stuff because I think it's so cool. Um, yeah, right. So that's a change over last year. Yeah, other than that, it's the same thing. So um, basically, um, you see these two, uh, these, these blocks here. Um, you see the learning objectives. Uh, I don't think I have to go through that now because the, these terms don't make sense to you. Um, so basically, we have these application blocks here. Here it's more a technical block, another application block. Uh, here's an application block that uh, takes one week, and that is a third part. So this is actually a three-week block, um, and so forth. I also have this lecture, Data in the Wild, as I call it. That's one of the final lectures where I contrast what you learned with what you see in the industry. Again, huge difference, yeah? But uh, I think it's important to, 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 yeah, to, uh, to help you <laughs> not, to, not to get such a big shock as I got when I went to industry. Yeah? I want, want to dampen the, the hit <laughs> so where you, that they don't hit the wall uh, that hard as, as I hit the wall when I went to industry. Yeah? Because uh, if you know about the differences, uh, you, you can tackle it much better. Huh? And then there will also be a recap lecture, finally, where I... Um, yeah, go through the most important takeaway messages. Yeah, that's the plan. Any comments or questions about anything missing? Anything I should add? Yeah. From Wolfgang Maas? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, that, so, so we have more technical focus here from the computer science domain. I know uh, Wolfgang Maas has more uh, as a business focus. The modeling aspects clearly overlap, but I haven't tracked so far what he is doing. I promise this lecture will be more difficult than that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Textbooks? Skip the textbook? No, no, in sections that we don't need. What do you mean by textbook? The textbook you recommended. So, you mean Alphonse Kemper or what? So, okay, okay, let me say something about textbooks and then we go get back to your question, okay? Yeah, so what is, uh, that's a, qu a common question, which textbooks to use? So I will, so the, um, 
uh, I'm not sure whether I have it here or maybe I only recommend it in the next week. Um, so there's a textbook by Alfons Kemper, uh, Datenbanksysteme. That's a book in German, unfortunately. There are a couple of other books that are in English, uh, Database Systems by um, Navate and Esri Emri Navato or something like that. That's the English book that's really good. So the syntax um, terminology I'm using here is the same as the one in the Kemper book. Now you will also see it in the syntax. It's a bit weird here and there, the syntax, but I do that on purpose to not confuse you because you will see throughout different database textbooks, yeah, there's very different syntax and it, it can really drive you mad. Yeah? So if you want to be on the safe side, if you understand German, look at the Kemper book. That's fine. And the other, if you don't understand German, look at the Navati, Navate book. Yeah? Um, so this is not so much a classical database lecture, as I said, as I go through the concepts. Uh, it's more driven by those applications. So here and there, I might be recommending other uh, books. I might be recommending papers. I might say, okay, sorry, there's no book here. Or I, I recommend, uh, no book I really wanna recommend. Yeah? So I think you can learn this stuff without looking at the book. Um, because uh, my understanding is that the slides are so complete that it should work. You, you can still read, um, we have many uh, videos, I will get to that in a moment. Um, we have uh, videos in two different versions. So um, we had different versions of this lecture and the first um, version where I did um, videos extensively was in, I don't know, 2013 or something. And they explained the same material from a different angle. Yeah, so for a lot of the content, you will have two classes of videos that explain it from a different angle. Yeah, so I, I hope that will be enough. Yeah? But if you, uh, obviously if you feel like, hey, can you recommend something for this specific topic and there's no link on the slides, you can always approach me and say, maybe do you have another book that yeah, I could read? Yeah. I, I can look at the semester apparat actually. I'm not so sure whether it has all the English books I have in mind because Last year it was in German, the lecture. Maybe there are some books missing, but we can fix that. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions about the schedule? Then we get to exams and stuff. So I, I don't do a break today, yeah, because uh, today it's a shorter lecture. We'll need another, I don't know, half an hour. Uh, but usually I do a break, so we start a quarter past, do a 45 minutes, 10 minute break, and then another 45 minutes. So. Okay, so here again, there's a distinction. If you, if you found out, hey, there's another lecture that sounds very similar, there's uh, database systems. Database systems is the core lecture. This is an undergrad lecture, big data engineering. So here we focus on the principles, design patterns, and application of big data technologies. The core lecture is a deeper dive into the underlying techniques, yeah, where we really look more in the, uh, into the algorithms and physical organization. Yeah? But, but you have to first master this stuff to make sense of this stuff. Yeah, that's basically what I uh, uh, am doing. So those are the research areas I'm in. You know, feel free to check out our webpage. Um, so those are the conferences uh, we are publishing at. So feel free to check out that we got a couple of awards for this lecture and other awards uh, and then other lectures. Um, f uh, feel free to check out my YouTube channel. Um, so a lot of um, lec uh, lecture videos, so also tons of recordings uh, from previous lectures. The, the, you will find recordings from last year's lecture in German. Yeah, there's no recording of last year's lecture in English yet. But as I said, I'm recording currently. So um, you will get a recording anyway. Yeah, I'm also responsible for the data science and artificial intelligence programs, bachelor and master. Yeah, that's all you need to know about myself. So those are the tutors. He was uh, Nix, is a, a chief tutor, a PhD student. He already um, was a chief tutor last year in the lecture, so he's very experienced. And other than that, we have um, these tutors, um, Simon, uh, Simon, Rink, uh, Simon Rink being the, um, the supervision tutor. Um, you can check it out by navigating to that link. Yeah, lecture, as I said, <clears throat> if you are confused that the LSF contains two entries, someone saw that, has two entries, another on Tuesday, right? Ignore it. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, it's a leftover. Um, it used to be a three-hour lecture where every other Tuesday there was another lecture. We don't do that. We only meet here every Thursday 
And uh, we assume that you use the spare time to prepare yourself with Python a little bit if that's necessary. Yeah? If you never used Python, then you, then you I will say something about that in a moment. Um, so if you study D DSAI, for instance, you got a Python crash course in the first semester, don't worry, yeah? or maybe programming too, a little bit of, you did a little bit of that. Um, so that's something we will be using. So the materials are available in CMS or in uh, GitHub. Um, there will, you can download uh, the Jupyter notebooks I will be using. We have office hours. Um, you can also check that out in the calendar of our CMS. Um, they take place here. There you can ask questions on assignments um, and uh, also about concepts from the lecture. And uh, we also invite you to answer those. Yeah? If you see something from a f uh, fellow student and feel like, hey, I could answer that, yeah, answer that. Yeah? So the idea is not that um, it's not in the, not in the um, um, office hour, but in the forum. You will see that in a moment. Uh, you can also uh, answer those questions from fellow students. If you have a question to me, feel free to approach me after the lecture or um, in the lecture break. Um, I also use part of the break to actually recover, but at least after the lecture, it's fine. If you have questions about the lecture, if it takes a little bit longer, we can also make an email appointment. That's totally fine. Yeah, we will offer you Vagrant support. Uh, I will say in a moment what Vagrant is. Um, and that's important that you really, um, yeah, try to install Vagrant and get it up and running in the next weeks. Tutorials take place on site on Mondays and Tuesdays in our seminar room. Um, so it's all in, in CMS. It's designed as a lab, so we'll have uh, 50 minutes uh, to discuss solutions of the uh, handed in assignment sheets and then 75 minutes of teamwork solving simple exercises. So we don't want it that people just uh, yeah, stand uh, um, at the blackboard and uh, present solution. It's really, uh, the idea is to engage you, to really make you work on the stuff because it's, don't underestimate that. You won't understand this stuff by just staring at slides or staring at videos. It's really important in all of computer science um, and math as well. You have to try to apply the stuff. Yeah? So we really invite you to go to the tutorials and um, yeah, make use of that. Yeah, each uh, tutorial will deal with a 90 minute lecture, of course. You should choose your preferred tutorial slots by that um, um, point in time. We will then assign you, um, yeah, everything is on the slides, okay. Assignment sheets um, released after the lecture every Thursday, late afternoon to early evening. Uh, submission until the start of the next lecture, oops. As I said, groups of two to three students. So look to the left, look to the right. So you can say, maybe just give it a try now. Everybody looks to the left, yeah? Let's give it a try, it's really, I'm not kidding. <laughs> look to the left, yeah? So for most of you, there will be someone say, hey, and say, hi, hey, do you already have a, a, a team to, to hand in your assignment? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit unfortunate for you guys, yeah? <laughs> Now do it the other way around. Look to the right. So in your case, it's the other right, yeah? Yeah, do you have a team to work on this? Hey, should we drink a coffee? Uh, what? Do you, yeah? No, what, what you? Uh. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and I suggest, um, Okay, 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 enough of chatting. You can do this chatting afterwards, okay? Um, so if you, if, you, if you by now don't have a team yet, I would suggest uh, everyone who is looking for a team just stands here after the end of the lecture and say hi, yeah, right? And then you, you, you build teams. So teamwork is super important in all of computer science. Super, super, super important. Mm -hmm. um, what else can I say? Yeah, you can all read, right? Um, yeah, plagiarism, of course, not funny. Um, don't give, don't try it. Um, yeah, general rule at the department is first time, hey, don't do it. Second time, you may be expulsed, uh, expulsed from the program. Stop studying. Yeah? Don't, don't try. Yeah? And you also hurt yourself yeah? because, again, the idea of the assignment sheets is 
for you to apply, try to apply the stuff. And eventually you have to do that anyway in the exam. And if you didn't exercise that in the exercises, you will fail the exam for sure. Exam admission, at least 50% of the points, as in other lectures. Maximum of two assignment sheets with zero points or not submitted. Um, exceptions are if you're uh, sick, yeah? but then we need a um, certificate from your doctor saying hey, you were sick like that week and couldn't do anything, that's fine. Yeah? Then we make exceptions, but other than that, no exceptions. Yeah, chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new slide. <laughs> I didn't know what chat GPT was last year when I gave the lecture. I learned about that last winter term when I, when I gave the database systems uh, core lecture. So who of you has you, uh, used chat GPT already? Hands up. Yeah. <laughs> who used it for university stuff? Come on, be honest, right? Uh, yeah. Who has never used uh, a chatbot AI to do uni stuff? Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, my clear recommendation is you should. You should. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty insane what's happening. There's an exponential um, explosion of these AI technologies. Yeah? And uh, yeah, just to tell you a story of, uh, so well, I tried, I played with that the first time in, in winter. In, in, two, in, two, in two ways. The one was in the lecture. I gave a summary lecture for the database core lecture. This is fifth semester bachelor and starting. Yeah? So I, I summarized the entire lecture, and then I always asked ChatGPT, is there anything else to know about that? Or uh, how is tra la 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 la? Or explain the concept. And the quality of the answers varied from complete bullshit to super brilliant. Yeah, and that's kind of a difficulty. For me, it's okay. Yeah, I can detect it. I can say, no, no, uh, that's wrong, obviously. It should be like this and that. Yeah? And, um, but, but one of the answers really bl blew me away. It was on the level of a postdoctoral student, an experienced postdoctoral student. Yeah? And it was phrased like you could copy it and put it to a database textbook. Yeah. It was insane. Yeah? Others are like, um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and others are like, yeah, okay, the starting is fine, the structure looks okay, but the numbers are complete crap. Yeah? So that's a difficulty for you because you don't know the material. So if you blindly use it, mm, yeah, then maybe it doesn't work. Yeah? Um, so f the rules um, we are setting up for this lecture is you're fine to use it. Um, that's okay. Yeah, these tools are reality, yeah, like, other, like, like IDE. You, use, uh, you can use uh, whatever, Vim, or you can uh, hack your code on a command line, or whatever um, you use as an editor, or you can use PyCharm, a super cool uh, IDE. Yeah? So that's a huge difference, to my understanding. Um, don't tell my PhD students that I complain about Vim. Um, yeah, that, that's okay. Yeah? But, uh, What's important for us, the rules of good scientific practice have to be followed. So, um, and that's in, a, uh, in accordance with, um, uh, with what university, the uh, university uh, issued a document where they give your recommendations and basically we copied that text from that recommendation. So the rules of good scientific practice have to be followed. So you have to mark ChatGPT as a source and you have to document the used prompts. Yeah? It doesn't mean that on every assignment sheet you have a footer saying, yeah, I use ChatGPT. Yeah. No, no, that's not what we mean. It means for, for the, the specific part that was solved by ChatGPT, you should mark that somehow and also um, say which prompts, prompts as the text inputs you used. Yeah? That's the recommendation from the uni and we want to stick to that. If it's not, um, if you use ChatGPT Chat and it's not indicated as a source, that, that may be uh, considered an attempt to cheat, so plagiarism. So, yeah, so really cite it as a source, as, as a citing uh, literature in research and thesis work. Yeah. But well, the problem is you won't be able to use it in the exams. Yeah, so there's no ChatGPT um, helping you to, to do this stuff. So um, you will be hurting yourself if you just use it blindly without yeah, uh, seeing it as a learning experience. To my understanding, um, do you have a recommendation on that? 
Yeah, I have recommendation all that, yeah. So um, as I said before, the quality of answers may vary. It may be complete uh, rubbish, may be great. Yeah? And the problem is to distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, the former from the latter. So my recommendation is really try to solve the exercises yourself first. Yeah? Otherwise, you will hurt yourself. And even every week, you just copy your assignment sheet into ChatGPT and see what happens and then hope to get like uh, over the 50% bar. No. Yeah? Because again, in the end, the goal of the exercises is to prepare you to be able to apply the material form from the lecture yourself. And if you leave all of that to the machine, you won't learn from solving the exercises yourself and will have a hard time in the exam. So basically, if you solve that, it's the same as copying assignment sheets from a colleague or having a, um, a team where you hand in solutions and only one of the students does the work and the other two are just managing. Yeah? Um, that doesn't work. Yeah? It, 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 it gives you that illusion, yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm, I have more than 50%. Yeah? But then comes the exam. Yeah? So in previous iterations of the uh, lecture, we, we, we had a midterm exam to filter out those students. So we don't do that anymore. There's a final exam. But uh, I guarantee if you don't do the exercises yourself, you won't pass the exam. It's, it's just it's not going to happen. Yeah? So um, in addition to that slide, what I really recommend is, and where I think ChatGPT is already great, is um, to um, explore topics. Yeah? Ask ChatGPT, explain SQL as if I were a five-year-old. Explain uh, database technology as if I were a five-year-old. I don't guarantee that that is correct, but it's, uh, from my experience, it's not bad. Yeah? And then you can also, okay, compare that to what I said. Yeah? Maybe that's a great experience here. You, you ask um, ChatGPT about the topics I'm presenting to you, and then we compare. Yeah? And maybe there's a difference, and then either ChatGPT is wrong or it's me. Could happen. I'm fine with that. Yeah? Let's discuss it. Yeah? Um, but you always have to yeah, do sanity checks compared to other sources. I mean, Wikipedia is another source that's frequently used, but it has similar problems as ChatGPT, unfortunately, at least for database uh, stuff. There are, there are explanations on Wikipedia that are just not that great, to not say wrong. Yeah? So it's very risky. Uh, if in doubt, go to a textbook, yeah? database textbooks. Um, so maybe, maybe they have weird uh, explanations here and there, but, but they're at least correct. Uh, yeah, um, and the other recommended uses, um, well, I can show that in a moment because uh, uh, it's so cool. Um, let me show that briefly. So um, this um, chat GPT is exposed through uh, different um, IDEs. Um, so applications can integrate that. Uh, where should I go? So this is some web application we are developing currently and uh, whatever, um, what can I say? In this IDE that's called PyCharm, I highly recommend you download that. It doesn't cost you as a student. It's really cool. It, it's insane. Yeah, I don't know all the buttons it has. It has everything, Git integration and you name it, a Jupyter integration, whatever. And um, what you can do here is, um, maybe what, where can I show it? Um, let's find out what is, uh, whatever. Yeah, here's some Python code, whatever, what I'm doing. And uh, integrated into this IDE is something that's called GitHub Copilot. Yeah, you can barely see it here at the button. The bottom. And uh, that's basically an AI that looks at the context of the code and the projects and make of, the, of this project and makes recommendations for what I should code. Yeah, so it's an AI, AI integrated into my programming environment. I have to, um... So and one use for that is really to write documentation. Yeah? So it should be good practice, but sometimes you forget to write documentation or the code is a documentation, of course, or documentation spoils the experience, or you could say um, Writing, writing documentation for code is like explaining a joke. You shouldn't do that yeah, because, and so forth. Yeah? But, but for bigger projects, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah so what, what just happened? I, I um, do this pound sum symbol. The cursor is here after the pound symbol. And immediately, 
uh, the AI proposes a documentation that I should write. Uh, bulk create not possible due to inheritance. Um, other roles, which is actually right. <laughs> 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 yeah, and it's not easy to see in this case, yeah, because this can only be uh, seen um, if you understand what this class is doing. Yeah, and why, and it, it can only be seen by looking at the context above what I'm doing there. There I'm doing something that's called bulk create, whatever that means, yeah, or I'm doing it underneath, but here it's not possible, which is correct, yeah. And this is just what you get for free, which is completely insane, yeah, because it, it, it tells you, hey, this thing is understanding my code. Again, the same as in uh, chat GPT, sometimes you get crappy uh, comments, but sometimes it's really like, I sit there and think, um, yeah, what, huh? what? Oh yeah, 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 it's right, it's right, yeah. And that's completely insane. It's, it's like a wise guy sitting in my laptop making weird proposals. A wise guy in the sense, sometimes it's crap, sometimes it's really awesome. Huh? It's a totally new way of developing. Just one other story about that. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was developing an algorithm uh, that's called topological sort for whatever reason. Yeah, and then I wrote a document, did the same documentation trick as here. I knew I had forgotten to tackle a certain ex uh, special case. Uh, I, I didn't do it for whatever reason, because it worked for my data, it wasn't good, I should have done that, yeah. So I wrote pound symbol, yeah. The AI proposed, yeah, yeah, we are doing topological uh, sort to do X, Y, Z. I went to the next line, pound symbol, however, the case <laughs> is not handled. What? Yeah, so it clearly understood the algorithm, so the structure of the code, what it was doing conceptually, and that this thing wasn't implemented. It's insane. Yeah? It's also great to understand code from other people or understand your own code. Yeah? Try to write documentation, get an explanation. And um, the, interesting, the other interesting uh, um, use case you will be seeing is, so that's one uh, thing you can use here. If you write something like, uh, it's, uh, so in this language I'm using, Python, if you've never seen that, it has a certain syntax where a function um, is defined by using the de uh, same def, that's the definition of a function. And then what you could do is um, you give the function a very long name. Yeah? Load real data with um, a production users. So, boom. Yeah, you see now it's thinking about that, it's analyzing the context, and then, oh, yeah, there's code. Yeah? And then you can go through the code uh, one by one and see whether it makes sense. Uh, can I go through it? So, uh, uni countries, real data. Oh, understand that this function exists, that's cool. Create settings, yeah, yeah that's correct. Create fail, that's crap. Yeah, so up to here, it's okay. And then there's crap. Yeah? So one, one way of using that yeah, is you go to that and then you remove the stuff that doesn't make sense and then you already have a start for the function. Yeah? Rather than writing all of that yourself. Yeah? I think this is completely insane, completely insane. Yeah? Um, it, so it really changes the way how we develop software. And um, yeah, also you can, uh, it's another use case is uh, the third, before and then I stop, is uh, writing unit tests work, works uh, really well with these technologies. Yeah, I recommend doing that um, because the, the AI typically understands your API, how the function calls work, what you have to test, it understands the data model. It, it's insane. Yeah. Okay, so, so much about that. Yeah, exams, uh, those are the dates for the exams. Um, passing the lecture and grade is, uh, you have to have, as I said before, 50% of the points from the assignment sheets and pass one of the exams. Of course, if you, if you pass the first exam, you are free to register for the re-exam to improve your grade. The best grade will count, of course, for the overall grade. Python. So maybe let's, let's uh, so who how, of you never used Python? Oh, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. So it's now widely used in many, many courses. Yeah, so if you never used it, 
Um, I, have, I have tons of uh, videos in German where I explain Python and in particular only the stuff we will need for this lecture. Yeah, so it, it's really um, tailored towards, hey, that's the stuff you need. Py Py Python is huge, yeah? tons of libraries, uh, fantastic things you can do. But we only uh, need little, very little core for this lecture. So don't worry, uh, you can quickly learn that. So I will assume that you attended programming um, one and two. Yeah? So you had some exposure to programming. If you never attended programming two, this is the wrong lecture. Don't do this. Yeah? This is really, I'm building up upon that lecture. Programming one is maybe not that critical, but programming two is really, I expect uh, you attended that. So you had some exposure to Python, and then you will see it's, it's mostly some syntax. It's different in Python and how the tools work, and, but it's really easy. No comparison to learning whatever C or C++, which is a huge learning <laughs> curve, yeah? but not for, for Python. And of course, you feel free to use any other video, so that you will find tons of explanation videos on, um, um, on YouTube. Uh, so I recommend you start uh, with that uh, really soon, uh, if you never had... Uh, Never used Python. So we will be using Jupyter Notebooks to explain the concepts in the lecture. Um, that's also explained in the videos how that works. But again, feel free to use PyCharm or any other IDE. And we offer a virtual um, machine. So maybe, um, so what does it mean? So on virtualization, so that is what we call a layered architecture of a computer system. So basically when you have a piece of hardware like this one here, yeah, this is uh, hardware, yeah, my laptop. There's an operating system on that machine, Mac OS X in that case. And typically on that operating system, you run an application yeah, like this, um, yeah, like this IDE for instance, that's the application running on the operating system, which in turn runs on the hardware. But what you can do is you can use what's called a virtual machine. And the virtual machine um, has a guest OS yeah, so basically the virtual machine, for instance, could run um, Windows or wh whatever Windows variant or an another Unix variant and then run an application on top. So for th that application here on top, it looks like as if it were executed on a native host operating system. The application here doesn't know that there is just yeah, a simulation, so to say, simulating um, that operating system. Yeah. So um, this is a technique that, that's widely used um, in computer science, uh, in particular all kinds of architectures, deployed architectures, where um, you don't run the operating system on the machine, but run it in some virtual environment. And that has many, many advantages. In particular, all the tool chain we use, would, uh, if you install it directly on the host operating system, that may be very difficult. Yeah? It may lead, uh, it leads to tons of errors. It, it, it's different on Windows than it is on, on this Windows machine. It's different than on the other Windows machine and on Mac and on Unix, whatever, whatever. So what we will provide you with is a virtual machine and that is done through Vagrant. Um, how that works um, can be found here. So I just ask you to not do it today because we are currently updating that virtual machine. Yeah, you can do it on the weekend. Till the weekend, you will receive an email that where we will say, hey, now it's fine, go for it. And that teaches you how to do that. Once you have that up and running, don't worry. Everything is installed. All the tools you ever need for the lecture is installed in that virtual machine. So you don't have to fiddle around with installing dozens of libraries and frameworks and stuff. Everything is in that virtual machine. Yeah, so um, there will be a tutorial, as mentioned above, where we um, help you and assist you in tackling issues with Vagrant, but please try it on your own first. Or if you, yeah, you're now building um, teams um, for your assignment sheets anyway, try to solve it in your team if, if there's an issue. Or maybe also look in the forum if there's an issue. Many um, issues can be solved like that. And only then um, ask in the tutorial, because otherwise it wouldn't scale. Yeah? Once you have it up and running, Things are really super easy. Okay, so that much about the slides. Maybe briefly, so the tools, you should have seen that. That's our CMS, so information materials is where we upload slides and uh, the recordings um, of the lectures. 
uh, there's a forum. Um, please look at that. It still has um, entries from last year, or is that? No, you, you won't be able to see that, I guess. It's, no, it's closed. No, maybe I think you should also be able to see that. Yeah, so that, that's a great opportunity. Also, if you don't find a, a, a team uh, for your assignment sheets, yeah, you can also write something here. Hey, I'm looking for a team. Who is also looking for a team? Blah, blah, blah. This is that was used um, uh, widely in the past years. So that's very important. Other than that, um, yeah, you have personal status pages. You have um, um, possibilities to upload stuff. Um, particular assignment sheets. So the assignment sheets will be um, all in the material section. Also the Jupyter notebooks will be here, um, except that we have um, the GitHub repository. That I probably, uh, oh, here it is. There's a link is in the slides where you will find all the Jupyter notebooks that I will be using in uh, this lecture. So it's all public and you can download the stuff here. There might be additions here and there, but if you all already want to look at that stuff, uh, you can go to that GitHub page. Yeah, I think that's it basically from my side. Are there any questions? No? Okay, then don't forget to um, um, give your preferences for, your, for the tutorial. Uh, very important. There's a deadline on that. And we see each other again next Thursday, 10.15 here. See you then. <clears throat>